Welcome to JavaScript Client-Side Templating Framework, EJS. EJS stands for Embedded JavaScript. You can find the web page for this library at embeddedjs.com. Now, if you go there, the first thing you may notice is that this site is kind of old. In fact, the last release for EJS was way back in 2009. That might as well be a thousand years ago in internet time. Now, that being said, why are we even talking about EJS? EJS is actually still used in a few places. You can see it being used in Node.js as a templating language for server-side JavaScript code. It's used in Harp.js, a static website generator tool. That's where I first saw EJS. Another reason that I think EJS is worth talking about is that it's very flexible. One of the things you'll see in the later libraries and frameworks that we look at is that sometimes they're a bit strict about how you use them. That's not a bad thing or a good thing, it's just how they work. What I found in EJS is that it's actually very, very flexible, and I can really appreciate that ability to kind of bend the rules and do what I need to quickly that EJS provides. Here's an example of an EJS template. You could probably guess that the special parts in here are the things that are wrapped in the brackets with the percent equal. What they mean in this case is take the variable name and actually return what the value is. Same for age. So if name was Raymond and age was 41, it would be, hello, my name is Raymond and I'm 41 years old. If you want to do logic within a template, instead of using percent equal, you just use the percent sign. In this example, I have a regular JavaScript for loop. Inside of that for loop, I have regular HTML and another example of outputting a variable, again, using percent equal. Like any other for loop, I have to end it as well. And that's what that last part at the end with the percent, closing bracket, percent, that's what that part handles right there. One more example of logic within a template. In this case, inside my loop, I'm checking the length of a particular value, a particular name in this case. And if it's equal to two, then I'm outputting a bit more. This gives you an example of how it looks to do looping and a bit of logic within a template. Now I'll be the first to admit, this is not entirely very pretty. When we look at other languages later on, you'll probably think they're a bit nicer to look at, and I definitely agree. But again, this is a good example of the type of flexibility that EJS provides. Now how about actually using EJS? There's a couple of different ways. Let's look at this one first. I begin by creating a new EJS object, and I could tell it the URL that points to my template. What you saw in those last few sides would be an example of that. I could then simply tell it to render, I pass in my data, and what I get back is the template with the variables and the logic all executed, just simple plain HTML that I can then put into my DOM, and in this case I'm using jQuery. Now this is very, very easy. There's also a problem with this particular approach. It's actually performing a synchronous AJAX request. What that means is that EJS will do an XHR to load template.ejs. It will actually pause everything while it does that, wait for the network response, and then take that and work with it. You may not know this, but when you do AJAX, you can actually do a synchronous request. Nobody does that because it's considered bad. In practical day-to-day -day usage, this probably won't matter too much, but it is a bad thing. Chrome, in fact, will actually print a warning in the console about doing a synchronous request. Unfortunately, with this particular syntax with EJS, you can't work around it. It's just how the library works. There is an alternate preferred way of using EJS, though. So instead of telling EJS a particular URL to load, I could also just pass the text of my actual template. So I've done a few things here. First thing I did at the bottom, notice I have a script block and I've actually put my template within there. Why does that work? Well, you can actually create script blocks that are not a JavaScript. You can see at the end of that script block, I have type equals text slash x dash ejs dash template. All this means is that when the browser sees it, it's gonna see that it's a script block that's not text slash JavaScript. It's not something it recognizes, and it's just going to ignore it. 
which is exactly what we want. The browser won't care about it, but it still exists within the DOM. Now go back up to my code, you can see I'm using jQuery to find that particular script block. I'm grabbing it by the ID, and I'm just grabbing the HTML out of it. So essentially what I have is a block that's invisible to the user, invisible to the browser. The browser is not going to do anything with it, but I can grab that HTML out, pass it to EJS within the text variable, and then get my rendered result once I pass the data. And this is typically how we will use EJS. Let's look at a few examples of EJS in action. There we go. It says, hello, Ray. It is great that you are 41 years old. Okay, not too exciting, but let's see how this was rendered behind the scenes. So I have my template here. I have a couple of things going on here. First, I have to actually load EJS, and I just downloaded the script from the website. I also use jQuery, and to be clear, jQuery is not required. It just makes things easier. I then have a document.ready block, and I simply create my data. And then I'm using that URL form of EJS to perform that AJAX request to load my template. I render it by taking the data, and then EJS will replace those tokens, put them into my template, and give me a simple string. I pass it to my console, and I actually put it back in the DOM, and that's how we got that result. I can actually go into my template file and modify it a bit. Let's say I'm really excited about just how darn old I am. I'll wrap that variable in strong tags. I will save it. And if I go back to my browser and reload, we will see that, boom, now my age is a bit bolder. Let's look at another example. So this is pretty much the same thing as last time, but I've moved that template into the page itself, and you can see it at the bottom there. So now if I wanted to modify the template, I would simply type into here. I can use jQuery to do an asynchronous request to the EJS file I used before and work with it like this, but this is a nicer, simpler example, and it shows you how to work with the other form of EJS. And again, this is the style that you are going to prefer to work with when working with EJS. The result's the exact same, but notice that Chrome did complain about that asynchronous request. Let's compare that to the nicer version. and. No complaint from Chrome, and obviously the same output. And again, if I want to go in here and modify stuff, it is a simple matter of typing in HTML. Save it, reload, there we go. Now it's nice and bold. Let's look at another example. All I've done here is made my template a little bit more complex. I've added a new variable called bio to my template. You can see I'm just outputting it right after the line talking about my age. And I've included that within my data variable. So all I'm showing you here is an example of how you can begin to work with more and more data. It's a simple matter of using it within your template and ensuring that the data exists. Now, in case you're curious, I could pass more data than my template needs. That won't break things. So it's not that big of a deal. There we go, there's my bio, very, very exciting. Now let's look at one more example. In this example, I wanna load a set of people. If we look at the template, we could see it's looping over a set of people. For every person, it's gonna print their name and how old they are, so not too complex. I'm actually calling my server to load the data. Now in this case, it's just a simple flat file, people.json. When I get back from that asynchronous AJAX request, I can take that data, in this case it's called res, and pass it right into my template. If we look at people.json, you'll see it's just an array of objects. You can say name, age, etc. So what's gonna happen here? Let's see. And it broke. And if we look at the console, we see that people is not defined. So that brings up an interesting question then. How do I pass in this data so that I can actually loop over it? In our previous examples, we just had one simple object. That object had a name, an age, and a bio in our last example. But how would we work with an array of values? Obviously, it didn't work like this. Let's look at the fix. So the issue really was in how I addressed that data. Because I didn't give it a name, in this case, people, it wasn't really available to my template in a way that I could use. So the only thing I did here was take that raw array of data, those people names, and I put it into a new package, essentially. 
I called that package data. I created a key called people, and I took the result from that Ajax call and put it in there as the value. Now I pass data to my template. It actually has a people value, and this loop will work. Just to be sure, let's run the browser and see. Now you can see my data showing up correctly. Now that it had a better way to get the values, get the array of names, it rendered just fine. And from here, we could start making modifications. We can modify the template to include a bit more logic. We can also update the data, and everything is just going to work perfectly. And I have this nice separation so it's easier to work with. Let's look at a simple example of modifying the template. All I've done in this one is modify the template so that it notices when a name is a bit too small. In this case, I've embedded the logic within the template, and it says if the person's name is less than four characters, we're going to output some additional HTML. In this case, your name is kind of small. So if we go back to our browser and run this version, we can see now that it recognizes my name, Ray, is kind of small. But what's cool is that if my data changes, if it was dynamic, for example, and somebody named Abe showed up, their name would automatically be flagged as being kind of small. Thanks for watching this O'Reilly training video. If you'd like more information on this topic, click on Learn More. Don't forget to subscribe to the O'Reilly Video Training YouTube channel for more tutorials. And be sure to like us on Facebook.